What's up folks, this is Justin from Books, Bricks and Boards, and today I'm going to talk to you about solo gaming. Specifically, how you can turn your favorite RPG into a solo experience. You might be asking yourself, but if a large part of my fun is the social experience of an RPG, why would I want to solo game? While it is true that the social part of an RPG is very fun, there are other aspects of an RPG that create enjoyment as well. And with a solo experience, you can do a number of things. Number one, if your group isn't interested in the game that you want to play, you could kind of scratch that itch by playing a little bit of solo on the side. Number two, if you're the forever GM, as many of us are, you could actually play as a character in the world that you are GMing without taking away the shine from your player characters. You can even develop your solo player as an NPC in the world in which your players are operating. You may not even have a group. Uh, if you don't have a group and you're really wanting to play an RPG, solo is an option. Also, you can use solo play as a way to test your adventures or written adventures before your players get to try them. That way you can make some balancing decisions <clears throat> in nips and tucks where it is required for your group to have the best experience. Lastly, you may just not have a group at all and you want to play. Either you moved and you no longer have a group or you've never been able to put together that right group of folks. Don't let that prevent you from enjoying any RPG that you're looking to try out. Now I will say this, solo RPGs <clears throat> rely much more heavily on procedural aspects uh, than a traditional RPG. With a traditional RPG, there is the back and forth between player and GM that creates some sort of an agreement on how the story should go. When you are the player and the GM, it is good to rely upon some procedural aspects to help create an unpredictable story. Otherwise, you may lose interest rather quickly. And that makes games <clears throat> that are very heavy on the story side of RPGs a little bit more difficult to solo, while uh, games that are much more procedural, such as Forbidden Lands, much easier to solo. But without further ado, I'm gonna get into what you need to solo your favorite RPG right now. I'm going now alone if I have to. The most dangerous cutthroat den of madmen in Chinatown. You can't just waltz in and out of there like... Like the wind. Yes, I can, Miss Law. All right, first thing you're gonna need is a core rule set to have your solo RPG experience. Now, while procedural RPGs are easier to solo, that doesn't mean you can't solo your favorite RPG that is not very procedural. As you can see, I've got plenty of options here, and I plan on soloing many of these. That being said, for right now, don't worry about the how, just worry about which one you want to try. The how will be decided by the emulator. Okay, so after you've established what core rule set you're going to use, the next step is going to be to find a good emulator. That's what takes the place of the game master in a solo RPG experience. Now, emulators primarily serve two purposes. They're going to help you answer yes or no questions, and they're going to help generate random events. Now, the thing with the yes or no questions are, <clears throat> you need to go into it thinking that you're going to be fair and logical. You're not going to try to power game the system because if you try to power game an emulator, you will win. And it will not be as enjoyable of an experience. Of course, the only one you're cheating is yourself, so travel at your own risk. Here I have two options. I have Mythic, which comes in many forms and has been around for a long time. This is the 2022 revised edition, which I picked up on print-on-demand through drive through RPG. I also have Oracle RPG, which is a free source that is available on oracle-rpg.com. Both of these have all of the things you would want in an emulator, but they do them with a different style. Uh, Oracle relies heavily on a deck of playing cards, 
Mythic is more based on a D100. So the one thing that is true with all of these emulators is the less you have to interact with them, the better the illusion that they are a true GM. If you're asking too many questions, you're going to always come up a little bit disappointed because it's just a, an algorithm. It's not a real person on the other end of that role. So after you have your core system and you have your emulator, you're going to need some content. Now there's some different ways you can go about this. You can do this as a complete sandbox, uh, whereby you generate the content on the fly. And if you're going to do so, then there's some amazing tools that Kevin Crawford's put out. Um, Kevin has his Without Number series. This is Worlds Without Number and Stars Without Number. And then Godbound, which is a similar uh, game. And those have free editions available online, which have all of the GM tools for random content creation. You also could run classic adventures. You could run new ones too, but why do that whenever the classics are available so cheap? So you could run your group or your, your solo hero through the uh, Keep on the Borderlands or the Isle of Dread or wherever you want to take them. Whether you decide to play published content or sandbox, you're always going to want some additional content generators to keep the experience more fresh and more unexpectable. So for that, you're going to want probably a random encounter generator, which likely the rule set you chose is going to have that. And you're going to want some map generators. So the map generators that I have here are... Axbane's Deck of Many Dungeons, which you actually draw a card to generate a quest and an end. And then there's a couple of cards with some random character uh, content generation. And then there's a lot of different dungeon rooms, and they all tie together as you draw them. Another option would be Dungeon Morph Dice. With these, you just roll up your dungeon as you go, and you connect the dice together to create your content. All of that's going to create something that's a little bit less expected and will enhance the enjoyment you get out of a solo dungeon experience. Now, on top of that, you can do contextual generation with, like, Rory's Story Cubes. With those, you roll the dice, you look at the picture, and in the context of what your hero is experiencing, you try to interpret what that would mean. In addition to those content generators that I just spoke about, you cannot have enough random tables. This series from Matt Davids is available on Amazon. Each of the books costs around seven or eight bucks, and they have a wealth of different random tables. Like, I think one of the tables is actually things you might find on the body of a dead goblin. So, who doesn't want that table in their game? Additionally, He's expanded his line to cover other genres. So if you're going to be playing Cthulhu or uh, uh, Gangbusters, then this would be a great one for you to add to your game. Typically, these are going to give you name generators. They're going to give you context generators for scenes and just random things. So, for example, the random tables from the 1920s and 30s has which movies were famous during the different years of the 1920s and 30s. Now that we have that out of the way, we want to have a way to share our game. A, even a solo experience is best when it's shared. But you don't want to be the guy standing down at the game store droning on and on about the time that he soloed a dragon in the game that he was also running, Yawn. But a great way would be to contextualize your experience into a story in a journal. You can write it as like you were writing a short story. You could also blog it. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the different threads on the forums in RPG Geek are play experiences. You could do that with Solo, too. You could vlog it. You could uh, talk about your experience on YouTube. Or you could collect a bunch of your stories and, and put them together and, and write a book. Uh, me, I actually am going to be sharing my solo gaming with my sons as, uh, as a bedtime story. And I think that, uh, in general, as long as you're enjoying it, you're doing it right. But there are lots of different ways to keep this relevant 
for your solo experience. Okay, now we're getting to the good part. I'm gonna share my kit with you. This is the kit that I use to solo game, and also I pull it out whenever I need to generate content on the fly for my group. And this is gonna be <clears throat> invaluable, whether you play solo or you have any sandbox or any journeys in your game. So we're just gonna go through it one step at a time. First off, binder I got from Walmart for five bucks, um, printed off the cover, uh, generated the cover using an old blurry map of a game which shall not be named and just threw some text over it. <clears throat> in the front, I keep my character sheets. I keep blank ones for whenever my characters die. And then I keep the completed character sheets in the back because the ones in the front get used quite frequently whenever characters run into trouble. So the front of my solo and sandbox kit is going to be the solo gaming tool. Now, this is the free tool that I mentioned earlier, and I will put um, a link to it in the description of the video. But when you go through it, it's got tables. Um, it does have some die roll tables, but the, the great ones that they have are these ones that are tied to card decks to generate contextual content. They also have a map generator, which you can use. I'm not as fond of the map generator in this, which is why I use a different tool, which I'll get to later. But then you can also generate content within a dungeon room. Now, this next part is very short. This is just the parts of the Mythic emulator that I use. This is the Fate chart, and this is my favorite of the yes-no charts of any emulator. And it should be because this is like the kind of the grandfather of these. But you get to choose a difficulty, and then the acting rank of whoever is doing it, and it will give you a percentage of a yes answer whenever you ask a yes no question. It also gives what an exceptional yes or exceptional no would be based on a, uh, a percentage of the original probability. The other thing that I keep from the Mythic emulator is the random events and the interrupt events tables. Now this one is stars without number, and you might think you could only use this with a, uh, a sci-fi game, but that's not true. Kevin Crawford is very sneaky in the way that he puts his content in his games, making it very usable no matter whether you are playing in the context of a sci-fi game or a fantasy game or a pulp game. Uh, so the front one here, and this is part of the free Stars Without Number uh, RPG revised edition document that you can get on Drive RPG. So I've got 100 adventure seats that you just kind of uh, play them like a Mad Lib and, and add your own uh, characters to them. I also have name generators for different cultures. One of the things that I do in my games is I tend to um, pick a language for each region or each culture in the RPG, and that is how I name that culture or region so that I can uh, be consistent in my naming principles. It also has names for places as well as people, men and women, on the tables. Then, you've got his one-roll tables. Kevin is great about these. Basically, you take your seven traditional polyhedral dice, you roll them, and together, they generate a very fleshed-out uh, character of an NPC. You can do the same thing generating patrons for your players. And again, this is from Stars Without Number, but it could easily be used in a fantasy game. <clears throat> and then, this is Urban Encounters. So this is the same thing. You take all your seven polyhedrals, you roll them, and it will generate a random urban encounter. So let's say I rolled a D4 uh, and I got a two. What's the conflict about? Respect, submission to local social authority. I roll my D6 and I get a four. 
It's inside of a local business. I roll a D8 and I get a seven. Uh, why are the PCs involved? The seeming way out just leads deeper in. I roll a D10 and I get a three. An established setting is being robbed. I roll a D12 and I get a five. A blistering, obnoxious off-worlder is the antagonist. I roll a d20, and I get a 13. The relevant ur urban features are feral dogs or other animals crowd here. So with that, I just rolled a handful of dice, and I have a pretty well-thought-out situation that I need to resolve. This is great for a solo experience. Next in my kit, I go to the Worlds Without Number tools. This is also in the free Worlds Without Number document that you can get on DriveThruRPG. So with this, I love the one roll monstrous context. It will tell you why a monster is doing what it's doing rather than just it wants to kill, it wants to eat, it wants to hoard. It gives some more fleshed out ways uh, that a monster would operate. I have a wandering encounter table. That's always useful. Social challenge targets. So what when you're negotiating with someone, what do they want and what do they need? Uh, what are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? I have some treasure tables in here. Uh, also combat complications. So rather than always fighting in an empty arena of combat with these combat complications, you can um, inject some reality and also some just challenges into your experience. Makes them unique. i uh, got a, a table for generating ruins. And then several of these are to fill out those ruins. Ways to generate spots on a hex map. The next I have... Uh, just one table from the Godbound, well, I guess not one table, one set of tables from the Godbound rules. This, again, is available on the free Godbound document available on RPG, or uh, Drive-Thru RPG. So this one may be a little confusing based on the title. This is called Creating a Court. Well, that doesn't sound like something I would need, but by Kevin Crawford's definition of a court, it's really any organization, and there's specific tables for types of organizations, aristocrats, bureaucrats, businesses, communities, criminals, and temples or churches. All of these are one-drop roll tables where you roll a few dice and it generates a rather interesting um, response for how this organization would act. So now I'm going to get into more of the specifics for the game system I am currently playing solo. That's being Forbidden Lands. So I have this broken up into two sections because I have creation tools. Forbidden Lands has some great creation tools, as do most of the Free League games, for creating content on the fly. Creating villages, creating dungeons. <clears throat> creating castles. And you can do this all with minimal or no prep. Creatures and NPCs and treasures. All within the regular game set that you would play with a group. Very valuable when you're playing solo as well. Also, uh, the Forbidden Lands has a legend generator which you roll and create, can create very evocative stories of what your heroes should be doing or responding to. This next section is also Forbidden Lands, but is the encounter tools. So Forbidden Lands has this really cool encounter system that has story-based encounters based on the type of terrain that you're in. <clears throat> then on top of that, they have an old-fashioned bestiary with a random table, D66 table, to generate random monsters as well. I also printed out the monsters from the core books uh, so that they would be right there and I wouldn't have to flip through all of the uh, different books to find what I wanted. It's right here. The last thing in my book here 
is The Undercity Tools. Uh, the Undercity is a book that is available on DriveThruRPG for like five bucks. And the only thing I took out of this is the dungeon creation uh, system because I thought that it was really fresh and interesting and it had lots of contextual additions uh, like features of the rooms and things that I really liked. So I added that to my book as well. Then at the back here, I have my dungeon tracker, which I got from the Necrotic Gnomes website, which is free. I have this laminated so I can use a wet or dry erase marker to keep track of it and reuse the same one. And then I also have my adventure worksheet, which is from the Mythic Emulator. This is a great way to document your solo adventures. And I did laminate this as well so that I could reuse it. Just wipe it clean after I use it. Now, that is most of my kit. But as I mentioned earlier, I also have some other tools that I like to use, including the Rory Story Cubes. This is the Fantasia set because it's got a little bit more high fantasy uh, types of images. And that is something that you can roll to ask contextual uh, questions of the emulator. I actually use these to create the dark secrets of my Forbidden Lands heroes. Another kit that I like to add, sometimes I don't want to pull out the old Undercity book to generate a dungeon, so I use these dungeon morph tiles, and these things all line up and go together, and you have yourself a nice, complete dungeon map after you get it done. So that created a uh, not an eight room dungeon right there uh, in a snap. So the crux of this video is that solo gaming does not have to be difficult and it doesn't have to be done with a, a system that was specifically designed for it. The main thing is have a plan, have a toolkit and have fun. So until next time, this has been Justin from Books, Bricks, and Boards. If you like the content, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And I'll see you next time. Good gaming, and God bless.